Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, CHC Coffee and Chat. We're so happy to have you guys here, and we're so grateful to Karen for giving us time. Um, before we get started with Karen's talk, I'm going to introduce you guys to our admin, Michelle Stoles. Many of you have sent emails, and she's the one who responds to you guys, takes care of all the behind the scenes work. And she's going to just quickly tell us about the upcoming exam and then it will be all Karen. So Michelle, take it away. Thank you. Thanks for having me and giving me a few minutes to talk. Um, I've been here since November, so I recognize some of your names, um, but this is my first coffee chat. Um, I have some information that I wanted to share where we are in our annual timeline because we're halfway through the year now, um, but I don't want to take time away from the event. So if you have questions, just email them to me. I'm going to put my email address in the chat when I'm finished. Um, this is going to be really quick. Um, so first of all, I wanted to touch in. If you're already certified, uh, you're probably thinking about your continued professional development activities right now. Um, and I wanted to remind you that you can upload your CEU documentation into CERTAMI at any time throughout the year. You don't have to wait until the November 30th deadline. Um, and if you have any questions about what those activities are, or how to interpret categories, just send me an email. Uh, second, if you're not yet certified, you may be interested to know that we currently have three pathways that you can take to take to apply for the exam. Um, as we approach mid-year, it's really important to note that one of the pathways is expiring in October. So you'll want to listen closely to see if that applies to you. Uh, the first pathway is for applicants who have graduated from a program in the United States or Canada that's accredited by Achina or CHO. Registration for this pathway will open in August for the October exam. So the next exam that's coming up is in October and registration for that opens up in August. The second pathway is for applicants who have graduated from programs outside of the US or Canada that are not accredited by Achina or CHO. Uh, this pathway requires a pre-qualification evaluation before registering for the exam. The CHC is currently accepting requests for the evaluations right now, so it's a good time to review the eligibility doc, uh, requirements on our website and um, gather up your documentation to submit for review. The third pathway I want to highlight for a minute, this is the one that's expiring. This is for applicants who graduated in 2019 or prior from non-accredited schools. This option is expiring after the October 2022 exam, and it requires pre-qualification. So you'll want to go and review the eligibility requirements on our website um, and get that submitted quickly so you don't miss out on this opportunity. Um, so to recap, uh, if the pathway that you'll be following for certification requires pre-qualification, please consider going to our website and reviewing the eligibility and submitting your documents really soon. The CHC is currently reviewing them, so that's, this is a really good time since we're mid-year. It's going to come up really fast that October exam. Um, all of our eligibility requirements are listed on our website at homeopathicdirectory.com. But again, I'm going to add my email address into the chat and our website and the link for the eligibility information in the chat for you um, so I don't take up any more time. So I think we might be ready for Karen now. Thank you so much, Michelle. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. okay. So um, Karen Allen really doesn't need any introduction. I think we all know and love Karen, but I'm going to still try. Um, she changed careers to homeopathy after seeing a remarkable response in an illness for one of her children. As a clinician with 28 years of experience, her focus of interest is in reproductive and endocrine health issues, especially those that impact fertility. Karen's teaching is known for her engaging style and case-based materials. She presents at alternative medicine and homeopathic conferences around the world. She has previously served as an adjunct faculty at the Boston University's homeopathy department, past president of the Council for Homeopathic Certification, past education director for Homeopaths Without Borders, and she currently sits on the National Biofield Committee for the Integrative Health Policy Consortium. 
She is also the director of trinityhealthhub.com, which is an online resource for education, mentoring, connection, and advocacy for homeopaths and those who use homeopathy. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Karen. Thank you. Golly, it's wonderful to see all of you here. I'm honored that you've got the time and inclination to come and spend this time with me. And I wanna say thank you to the folks at the CHC for organizing this and for all of the work that they do, everybody who's on the board and Yashi and Michelle. I'm really grateful. There's a huge amount of time that goes in to making that process happen. And uh, both on the, the part of the organization and on the part of every single person who's put in the time and energy and money and effort to become certified. And it makes a massive difference in our profession and how our profession is regarded and how we are regarded and the opportunities before us. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who's here. And we're going to talk about building your practice while staying current with CEUs. And I put together a little presentation based on some stuff that I had taught a few years ago about how to get clients, how to keep clients. And then I sent it to a couple of colleagues saying, would this help you if you were new building your practice? <laughs> and they sent it back and said, no, this is what would help me. And this and this and this. So what they basically said was, Karen, you need to tell people if you only had, if you were, you know, about to step off the planet and you were saying to people, as a practitioner, this is what I wish I had known the day that I started. And it would have made things much more successful for me. That's what you ought to teach. So that's what I spent time yesterday gathering and time today preparing for you, and I hope that it'll be helpful. I expect that this is going to be about 30, 35 minutes, and then after that, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, you can put questions in the chat or maybe in the Q&A if it's active, but we won't be going through them till the end. And then at the end, you'll be welcome to, you know, there's some things that just aren't so easy to ask in a chat. You'll be welcome to come online with video or audio. You just need to be aware this is being recorded, and if you don't want whatever you've got to say to be recorded, then you got to talk to me outside of this for something else. Okay. So what's our roadmap today? You know, there are some people, some practitioners who have super busy practices always and have for a long time and others not so much. And it's a very reasonable thing to ask why, why is that so? And then we got to ask each person how did the transition from, I was a great rockin' student, how did that unfold into professional practice? And then probably the more key question is, what specific steps could you take, could I take to, to get and keep clients? There are a lot of people who say, I think I'd be rockin', but I just, I don't know where to find clients. I'm not onboarding people. So how can you be a practitioner that people want to see, that they seek out, that they refer their family and friends to. So almost nothing that I talk about today is gonna to have anything to do with details of homeopathy. And all of it is gonna to have to do with being an amazing practitioner that draws to you an audience that is perfectly matched for you. And then we'll do some Q&A with your questions and comments. So I just want you to ask yourself, in the transition from student, I was not a very successful student in homeopathic school. Just got to own up to that. I might have been voted least likely to ever practice effectively. You know, I didn't really realize that until many, many, I went to the Pacific Academy School in San Francisco. And many, many years later, I eventually took over the school from Richard Pitt. And we had all these boxes of old records. And I was going through the old records, figuring out what we didn't need and could shred. And I found my file folder and it had notes in there from the teacher really needs to study. She's clearly not getting this. 
And as the daughter of five generations of MDs, the conventional medical bias died hard. It took me a long time. So I might have been voted least likely to succeed as a practitioner. I wasn't even a great student. I was a crappy student who barely made it through. And then my first five years of practice were horrible. It was failing and flailing all the way around. So we got to ask ourselves, why did that happen? Why does that happen to some of us? Is it just me? I thought it was just me. And I want to share with you all, it's okay. Take a breath. If your practice is not where you want it to be right now, there's nobody to blame. It's not the school's fault. It's not the fact that we're an emerging profession. It's not the current clinical paradigm. It's just an opportunity to see things differently and to work a little bit differently. And I wanna share with you that your opinions about yourself, about your failures or your fears or your shortcomings with your practice, they're just opinions, really. They're not facts. Mine were just opinions. After five years of practice, I quit. I said, I have had it. I can't do this. I suck. And I called my like 12 clients and I expected at least one of them to say, oh, no, 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 please don't quit. Please. And they all were like, okay, who are you referring me to? It was really bad. So I quit. And then I got really sick with dreadful things. And it became extremely clear to me that if I was going to stay on the planet, I had to do what I was called to do. And if I wasn't going to do what I was called to do, I wasn't going to survive. So I opened my practice again. And I made a commitment to myself that if I only ever had one client and I did my best for that person, that it was enough, that I was enough. And I want to promise every single one of you that you are enough right now, just as you are. You don't have to learn more. You don't have to lose 10 pounds. You don't have to open a fancy office in a different place. You are enough right now, this instant, to recognize all those lycopodiums and nature mirrors and, and mag carbs out in the world who are suffering. Homeopathy is a rare and valuable skill that you wield. All of you who are CCHs, you wield an amazing rare and valuable skill. If you're interested in understanding more about this, you can read Cal Newport's book, So Good They Can't Ignore You, highly recommended. I made this commitment that even if I was only ever gonna have one client, I was not gonna quit. I was never gonna quit. And I was gonna do my best for that one person. And everything that I'm gonna share with you today sort of unfolded. None of it was taught to me by anybody else. There are a few ideas that came to me from authors and I'll share the attribution of where those ideas came from, but mostly it just happened. And I believe that it can happen for every single one of you. So if there's any of you that are thinking like I did, my practice sucks. I want you to reframe that and say, I have a baby practice. I have a practice that's ready to grow. It's like a little bitty sprout and I'm gonna help it grow. And what I'm gonna share with you today are things to help you grow. So let's just talk about utilization. There are a lot of practitioners who aren't so busy. Uh, in 2006 and again in 2013, the American Medical College of Homeopathy did a practitioner survey and they asked homeopaths in the US and Canada about their client load. How many clients do you see? And for those who just do acute care, you know, there are people who are maybe uh, a chiropractor who did an acute care class or a massage therapist or a whatever. They're people who have added a little bit of homeopathy into whatever else they were already doing. They've got 30 to 60 hours of training. So 
For those people, they were doing two to three intakes and two to three follow-ups per month. And then the next category of practitioner they queried were integrative practitioners. A lot of these were folks who had more training, maybe 100 to 250 hours, the folks who come through the naturopathic programs, the folks who are already licensed in some way and do Boiron's CEDH program or take some, you know, it would have been what the old NCH summer school programs were, or they did a small training program. And for those folks, they do acute care and some chronic care. And they were doing seven to eight intakes per month and 18 follow-ups per month. And then at the CCH level, people who have 500 hours or more of training, and they've got a full homeopathic skill set where they can work at the level of a cell and a tissue and an organ and a body system and a person and a family line and a genus epidemicus. And, those folks were doing 15 to 16 new clients per month and 63 to 65 follow-ups. So they were practicing full-time. So let's just, let's look at what does this look like in real life? Let's imagine a, a, an imaginary homeopath, Fiona full-timer, who's got a full-time practice and her focus is mamas and babies. She loves working with that demographic. So she sees about 20 consults per week, and that includes both intakes and follow-ups. She works about 40 to 45 hours a week, which is average for a full-time homeopath. She manages her on-call with half an hour to an hour per day at the beginning and the end of each day. And when she audits her practice, about 70% of her clients are improving and she's working with the other 30% who are failing and flailing or struggling and she's getting them other help or she's referring them to another practitioner who can help them. She charges $125 per client interaction hour. So if she has an hour follow up with somebody, it's $125 and she makes about $10,000 a month gross. She's got four weeks off a year for holidays and training and vacation. So this is what a full-time practice can look like. And let's do a part-time practice. This is Paul Part-Timer. He has a partner with a terminal illness. And so he's taking care of his partner part-time. He works mostly with men who have urinary complaints. And he's really good in this niche. And he's well-known within the integrative community that he's part of. He has eight to 10 clients a week, about half time, 18 to 22 hours of work a week. He manages on call in about 15 to 20 minutes, Monday through Friday in the middle of the day. And when he audits his practice, 67% of his clients are improving, so about two thirds. And he's working with the other third to refer or to add additional focus or get supervision or whatever. He charges $175 per client interaction hour. He's in a kind of a higher rent district than Fiona. And he makes a little over $6,000 a month gross. He takes two weeks off a year for holidays and training and vacation. So these are models of what we could aspire to as practitioners. So what's your utilization? Full-time would be 20 consults a week, 80 consults a month. And, and those life situations vary. Do you want to be full-time? Do you want to be part-time? Mostly, practitioners want just enough clients. Not too many, so they're slammed. Not too few, so that they're underutilized. They want just enough. And for most of the integrative disciplines across all levels of certification and licensure, uh, Practitioners who do things other than drugs and surgery tend to be underutilized, but you can maximize this for your practice. So you might be sitting there saying, how, exactly what? So that's a great question. This is, this is the seven things that the colleagues that I talked to said, this is what you ought to talk about. These, if you will do these seven things, you will thrive. Okay, so the first one has to do with on authenticity. Connect to your why, and we're going to talk about that. The next thing is that you have to be memorable. People have to remember you and what you do. So you got to grab a niche. 
you got to be competent. You need effective skills in an area where there is need. You need to have clear definition and communication. You need to be a healing presence and have caring client support. You need to enlist participation and be an equal partner with your clients. And one of the methods that I use for that is diagnostic congruence. And then the last thing is that you want to help provide as a visionary a pathway from the land of ill to the land of well for a client who is hopeless and scared. And if you can do these things, people will stay with you. They will refer to you. They will travel far distances to get to you. So let's start with why, number one of seven. Why are we doing this? Why are you doing this? Why are you even here? Simon Sinek, who some of you may have seen his TED talk, he wrote this book called Start With Why. So a lot of times when we communicate about homeopathy, we talk about what it is. And then we talk about how it's better than other things, but we never get to why. And what I wanna invite you to do is to answer at the deepest level possible for you, why am I here and what is my work within the reason why I am here? What I came to when I was quite ill and it was possible that I was not going to stay on the planet was the conclusion that I was called to be a healer. And if I was going to say, I don't like that, I take my ball and bat and go home, then I wasn't going to be here. And so I made a deep commitment as a healer to show up. People feel safe within the strength of my knowledge of why I'm on the planet. And your clients will feel safe in the strength of your why. And so will you. And it gives you a beautiful anchor upon which to build an amazing thriving practice. So one of the things that Simon Sinek says is that you don't want to work with everybody who needs what you do. You want to work with people who believe what you believe. So let's look at the, the standard distribution of uptake in this diagram. There are innovators, the first 2.5% of the population to adopt something. This is where we are, guys. If we look at the statistics of how many people have actually consulted a professional homeopath, we're in that 2.5%. We're not to the early adopters yet. Now, the number of people who are actually using homeopathy on their own, they're definitely into the early adopters. But we are on this little skinny edge. We operate in a niche market and it's based on our deep and abiding beliefs in homeopathy as a superior technology. And so do our clients and colleagues. So we need to ask, how do we connect with that market? Who believes what you believe? At the bottom of this page here is a reference. And Yashi, are people going to have this document? If I send it to you, is there a way for them to request it or download it or something? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, I see some of you taking notes. Just know that you'll have this entire document and I'm super glad to give it to you. Thank you so much, Karen. You're the best. Okay, so in this article that's quoted at the bottom, this is a fascinating article that says, why do people choose CAM and what is the basis of their commitment and why do they keep going back to it? And it is because of these five beliefs. I trust that complementary and alternative medicine will be effective for my needs. We believe that. They do too. I believe that complementary and alternative medicine allows me to take a more active role in maintaining my health. Very important for some of the things we're going to talk about. I value the emphasis that complementary and alternative medicine places on treating the whole person. I value the way that CAM practitioners treat me as an equal partner in managing my health. And I prefer to take a natural approach to health and healing, which means that we want these beliefs 
to be imbued in all of our communications and style of work with the people who believe what we believe. So who is looking for you right now? These are people with an unsolved problem. And the people who, who have made their way to my practice, almost all of them have been through every conventional option, had negative experiences with many of those, have been through most of the other CAM options. They did soma therapy and chiropractic and upper cervical chiropractic, and they did um, acupuncture and Chinese herbs, and they've done a zillion things before they land at my door. These people will continue to strive until they find a solution. So they are highly motivated and incredibly persistent. And I just, when I found homeopathy, I was beyond desperate. And I saw Dana on here. I owe Dana a lifetime debt of gratitude because it was his book, Everybody's Guide to Homeopathy, that saved my daughter's life. I was desperate. If somebody had said to me, Karen, to heal her, you got to wait for a full moon and put a chicken in a bag and you swing it around your head and you dance the hokey pokey, I would have done it. I didn't care. I was desperate. And many of these people who will find you are desperately looking for the rare and valuable skill that you have. So I just want to remind you again, read Cal Newport's book. So. Number two, now that we've talked about your why and who's looking for you, grab a memorable niche. Let's just imagine that you are at a uh, some kind of professional gathering, a networking event, or a conference. And you're there with a group of three or four people, and somebody says, tell me a little bit about you. And uh, you say, I'm, I'm a homeopath. And they say, great, uh, who do you work with? Oh, I just work with everybody. And then they go to the next person and they say, tell me about you. And, and this guy says, yeah, I'm really interested in men's health. And so I do a lot of work with nonspecific urethritis and prostatitis. There are a lot of guys who really struggle with that. And there aren't a lot of good resolutions in conventional medicine. So I use homeopathy and herbs. And then they talk to the next person who says, yeah, I had a kid who went through a horrible experience with a soccer concussion. And I got really interested in that. And so in my practice, it's all uh, grade school age kids who are dealing with the fallout or sequela of concussions. And so I work with local soccer teams and I blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, now, let's say that you're the person who was asking those questions and you walk away to lunch and you go to your room later. Who are you going to remember? You're going to remember the soccer person? Are you remember the guy with the special niche? Are you going to remember anything about that person who said, yeah, I just do everything and I, I just work with everybody? There's nothing to hang your hat on. So... You need to find a niche, even though you might work with everything, you need to find a way for people to remember you and have a reason to come to you or refer to you, a problem that you solve. So you have to ask yourself, where are these people looking for help? This diagram here, these two diagrams or are from the Office of Complementary and Alternative Medicine that's now been named to something else. I don't remember what it's called now. And they did some surveys in 2002 and 2007. They've done surveys since then, but the data is not formatted in a way that makes it as useful to present. And when they asked people, what prompted you to go outside of conventional medicine into one of those weird CAM things? And I just want you to notice the first three things here are pain, back pain, neck pain, joint pain, arthritis, okay? This means that if you were to choose to get really good at working with back pain, your practice would be full. 
because people are looking for this. This is not well solved within conventional medicine. And anxiety, anxiety and depression, severe headaches or migraines, insomnia. These things are consistent, guys. These are the things that are driving people out of conventional medicine. Can you find a way to work with any of these folks? Can you select a demographic? And then you develop clinical skills in that niche. And this is where I wanna talk about continuing education. You need to choose carefully when you're seeking out your CEUs. I mean, we tend to look at what's being presented in a survey, uh, you know, across, oh, this is coming up in this conference or in this conference or this special webinar is happening. And we just, the, the same way that if we were flipping through channels on the TV and we say, oh yeah, okay, I'll do that. And we tend to be attracted to what's new or trendy. Somebody just published a book or they've got some new ideas about something. What if instead we chose CEUs that helped us thrive in practice? What if instead we chose CEUs that specifically helped us with our demographic niche? So I want to encourage you when you're getting CEUs to prioritize clinical skill development and focus on outcomes instead of a deep dive into interesting theory, which might help you, but is not gonna be nearly as relevant today, this week, this moment. Seek out training that's targeted for your practice. How do you support the demographic you've chosen? Exactly what clinical skills do you need to enhance? So let's say that you were the person who had the kid who had the, the um, Concussion. Let's say you devote 20 minutes, five days a week to doing a survey online on PubMed and uh, educational institutions, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic. You read everything that you can about what's happening. How are, are these concussions assessed? What are the different stages of them? How do you identify them? What are the risk factors? And you become extremely well-informed about it by reading and reading and reading and reading. And then what clinical skills do you need? How can you get training about head injuries? And then what pathophysiology do you need to understand? What adjunct training? You know, are there things with organ therapeutics or Bach flowers or herbs or um, acupressure or other things that would be helpful adjuncts that you can assign your clients to do to help you buy time while the remedy unfolds? What current research can you be gathering so that you can speak with authority and confidence to the clients who reach out to you? And what are the textbooks that should be on your shelf? You know, we looked here at joint pain, back pain, neck pain. Asa Hershoff has a fantastic musculoskeletal pain book. It's probably for sale in Dana's shop. It's a book that anybody who wants to work in that niche should work in. Steve Sabotnik has a fantastic book. It should be on your shelf. You should get yourself well-informed, and then maybe start a study group with a couple of colleagues who are interested in the same thing, where you begin to develop your clinical skills and follow up. You know, don't just take the class and say, well, that was fun. Calendar it. If it's not on your calendar, it's not real. So you put time on your calendar every week for clinical study. Okay. And then you hone your clinical outcomes. Review your cases. Every three to six months, you should be going over every case you've touched. Once a quarter is a great time to do it. And then ask yourself, who had the best outcomes? What was that demographic? How did that client come to you? What was the referral source? How did they find you? And what happened that worked so well for them? How do you do more of that? And what were the complaints that had the poorest outcomes? 
uh, you want to refer those peeps. You want to help move them along to somebody else who might be able to help them more. No guilt, no shame. Nobody heals everybody. Just help move them along on their way. And how did you get those clients in your door? Yeah, maybe those aren't such good pathways. Focus your practice on the clinical successes. There's a guy named Marcus Buckingham who does amazing talks on building on your strengths instead of shoring up your weak links. And I am a big believer in that, especially when it comes to practice. So build on your strengths. So number four, clear communications. How do we talk to somebody who is a desperate cam consumer who is probably on their knees praying for a solution for their kid who's about to die? That's where I was. So our usual elevator speech is, hi, this is me and I'm a homeopath and I'm gonna tell you, and there was this guy named Sam and it was amazing and homeopathy is so incredible and it's really safe and it's this natural thing and somebody's eyes are glazing over and they are looking for the exit because you are spouting a lot of information that has nowhere to land in them. They have no reason to listen to you until they have a reason to listen to you. So there's a guy named Michael Port who's got a book called Book Yourself Solid that I recommend highly read the first three chapters. You can get it from the library. It's been around forever. You can buy a used copy. He's updated it a few times, but it's basically the same material. So what he says, no jargon, no vocabulary beyond a second grade level, minimum communication. And here's his example. When someone asks me, what do you do? And I say, I'm really passionate about women's health. You know how some gals have really painful periods or they can't get pregnant or they can't stay pregnant. And people will say, oh yeah, my sister went through this really horrible blah, blah, blah. And then I say, well, I help them with that. And then they say, well, how do you do that? And then while I am focused on my why, the reason why I am on the planet, I say to them, I'm a healthcare practitioner. And then I ask them about them. I stop talking about me and I ask them about them. And I find out about them. This gives them no reason to have any aversion to anything, to have a negative reaction to any keyword, to, to be confused, because there are a lot of people that don't know what homeopathy is. They don't understand. They think it's herbs or they don't even know. And so even using that word can turn off people. And then when I'm in conversation, if they come back to me again and ask more questions, I use those CAM consumer statements. You know, I, I like working with people who really want to be involved in their health and want to work in a power equivalent way with a practitioner. I, I use those same things to help someone know what I believe so that we can find out, do we need to work together because we believe what we believe. So this is probably the most important slide of everything that I'm gonna share with you. I want you to think about communicating with everybody who wants your rare and valuable skills who you might not meet on a daily basis. I want you to do this visualization twice a day. It really, really, really works. You visualize yourself standing at the door of your office. And if you're like me and you do everything online, the door of my office happens to be the window of my laptop. And you say, hello, everyone, whoever your demographic is. Hello, parents of children who have soccer concussions in my state. My name is so-and-so. And I have great experience helping kids with concussions. If you are and you name off your criteria, then I invite you to contact me. And you can find me by blah, blah, blah. Let's work together and create health. And then you allow yourself to feel all that excitement that every practitioner feels when a client has had a fantastic response. And you just let yourself savor, oh, if people call me, it's going to be amazing to work with them. And you just wrap that all up in hope and joy. 
and you release it out to the universe and you do it twice a day. It takes two or three minutes. Okay, so when we're talking about criteria, what exactly does that mean? I'm gonna share with you the criteria that I used. Hi, women in the US. My name is Karen Allen and I, whatever your best skill is, that's what you wanna put in there. I listen deeply. I think that's my best skill. And so then I ask if you are, these are the five criteria that I use and you can mess around with this and put in whatever criteria you want. If you are someone whose case I can clearly see, if I can't clearly see it, I don't want you to come in and you don't want to come see me because I will be lost in the Thule's. If you are likely to respond well to the therapeutics that I can offer, if you are somebody who's responsible for your own health, if you have a personality that matches comfortably with mine, I have, I have foibles. I'm late for appointments when things run over. Sometimes I'm late sending out remedies for people. I am completely incapable of managing email because I have thousands of emails in my inbox that I have never read every single frigging day, even though I spend hours going through email. I have a lot of deficits. And for people who need somebody to be extremely prompt and answer their emails, I'm a horrible practitioner and they would not want to work with me at all. So they got to have a personality where there's a match and they have plenty of money to pay me. If you have those five criteria, then I invite you to contact me. And here's how you can find me. You can talk to any one of my clients or colleagues or students. You can visit my website, blah, 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 blah or I'm listed on the Blurt directory and the Blurt directory, and you can find me on Alignable and you can find me on Yelp and you can find me on Google My Business and blah, blah, blah. So I invite you, let's work together and create health. When I've been doing this consistently, my phone starts ringing. And I've had people who have called me who have told me things like, I found your business card. It was stuck like on a wad of gum on a sidewalk in Chicago. And there was something about your picture where I picked it up. And then I found out that you do infertility. And then I checked your stuff online. And so I'm calling to work with you. Okay. That's a pretty weird circumstance. You can invite people you will never meet. Use the vital force to be in resonance with those people who believe what you believe. So the next thing Five is be compassionate. 50% of Americans believe that our healthcare practitioners in general are not compassionate. And two thirds of people have had a meaningful healthcare experience with a lack of compassion. I had a client tell me a story one day about having a biopsy done on a lump on her breast. And she said she was in this sort of like tilt table thing and her breast was exposed. And the surgeon came in, didn't even walk around to the side of the table where she could see him. She never saw him. And he made the cut on her breast. And then um, as he was walking out, he said, doesn't look very good. And that was all she got. And it turned out to be benign, but it was a horrible experience for her. Compassion comprises less than 1% of all communication in healthcare. And you probably heard these stories from your clients. You may have experienced this yourself. So I want you to think about reading this book, Compassionomics by Traziak and Mozzarelli. It, it tells all the reasons why it's important. And he tells in there a story about Uppsala, Sweden, where there were two buses that ran into each other. And some people died and a bunch of people were seriously injured. And it's a case study that's written up now for all of the, how do you deal with a local disaster where people have to get medevac to multiple different hospitals in multiple different cities and fill up several different ICUs. Five years later, researchers contacted every one of those people who were alive and they asked them what they remembered. And everybody said they remembered the initial contact or the event or the sound. And everybody said, they remembered the lack of caring, the lack of kindness, the lack of compassion from the caregivers. And this wasn't just one or two providers. This was every hospital, every provider, their primary memory after five years. So 
We don't want to be that. You want to be the opposite of that in a way that supports your clients in careful communication. And here's examples of what takes 40 seconds to say. At the beginning of the consult, let's say that you're talking with somebody who's just had three miscarriages and she is heartbroken. And you say to her, I know this is a tough experience to go through. I want you to know I'm here with you. If there's something that I say that you don't understand, please feel comfortable stopping me and asking questions. We're here together and I'll go through this with you. And then at the end of the consult, you say again, I know this is a time that's hard for you. We're in this together. I'll be with you each step of the way. This is all it takes, guys, to completely engage someone's confidence that you are really there for them. So. Number six, uh, there was a research study that was done with the Harvard Business Review on consultants. And they asked companies that had hired a consultant two questions. Would you rate the consultant low, medium, high, good, bad, terrible? Or second question, did they solve the problem you hired them to solve? And what they expected was if they solved the problem, they rate them high. If they didn't solve the problem, they rate them low. What they found was that if the consultant and the client company had agreed on exactly what the problem was and what the solution would look like, they rated them very high. And it didn't matter whether they solved the problem or not. And even if they solved the problem, but they had never come to clear agreement, they didn't like them so much. So. What this means is that we need to communicate with our clients, not in a way that says, what's the matter with you? What's wrong here that I need to pay attention to? But what matters to you? After you have taken the case, at the end, you anchor the clients in your practice by asking them, how will we know if our work together is successful? What would a good outcome be? and you write it down and you let the client hear you say it to them and you use that to help prioritize. Okay, so now we're on our last point. Helping the client who may have been sick and disrupted for so long, especially by the time they get to us and they've got chronic fatigue or they've got whatever they've got. And they may not really even be able to imagine what the land of well looks like. So getting diagnostic congruence helps them have hope that there could be a land of well. So we want to help them build a little bridge, a pathway from where they are now to that diagnostic congruence. It sets the target. It allows us to benchmark where we are now and note progress. And it helps us discuss their health improvements through the four foibles of daily life. So a lot of times clients will say to us, how long is this going to take? Well, it helps to say there are stages to this work. First stage, fix what's broke. Second stage, get back to homeostasis. Third stage, build capacity. And so how long will this take is not just one thing. We can help them set specific goals by choosing some low hanging fruit, some accomplishable things. Let's look at an example. So let's say that there's Sally who has terrible migraines. She's a 47-year-old woman. We take the whole case. She's got left-sided migraines with a visual scotoma. They happen three to four times a month. They last about six hours. The pain is eight on a scale of 10, about half the time she vomits. She has them at other times, but they're worse with her menstrual period. And she hates her current job, which is very stressful, which she believes contributes to the migraines. And she has a hard time with low energy. She's barely able to get through the day without a power nap. And she doesn't sleep very well. Now she wakes all through the night with fragmented sleep, worrying about her job, hating her migraines, worrying if she's gonna have a migraine tomorrow, tossing and turning. And she's anemic. She has a really low hematocrit and low serum iron, okay? So when we do diagnostic congruence with her and we say, how will we know if our work is successful? How will we know if you are well? She says, no migraines. I would be doing meaningful work that I loved. I would have energy to get through the day. I would sleep through the night or maybe only wake up once and I would not be anemic. 
those are all really good goals, aren't they? So how do we build the pathway to help her partner with us? What's the low hanging fruit? We set goals that the client cares about and we choose the most achievable items and this we sort of negotiate. So you gotta ask yourself, what's reasonable in three months? Well, we can imagine that with good homeopathic care, her hematocrit and serum iron should be in normal range with, within three months. Let's give her some ferrum fos cell salts along with whatever else we're doing or some, um, some other, we talk with her about diet. We look at what else is happening in her case that might be interfering there. And then we say, let's set a goal of 30 to 50% reduction in migraines within three months, less intense, less frequent. If we can't get her a third better with the migraines in three months, then we need to up our clinical skills. Okay, and then we ask her to track her sleep with a device. And first we're gonna say, can you consistently get a four hour block of sleep? And then the second stage would be, can you wake only two to three times and then fall back asleep? Can you feel rested in the morning? Can you have an energy that is good through the day without a nap for three days a week? These are our goals. So, when we're planning a path, we look at what can we do with fix what's broke? Can we set a goal around pain reduction or in um, bothersome symptoms like itch or anxious or reactivity? Can we help with homeostasis like the sleep or a menstrual rhythm? Can we help with building capacity where somebody feels more joyful or more confident? This has a massive impact in the client. And just by setting those goals, we create a placebo effect. Oh my goodness, my practitioner believes in me, believes this can happen. My practitioner knows what he or she is doing and builds client confidence and builds the client desire to continue with you, to follow the path to completion, to not fall out. And by measuring, giving them a tracking chart or asking them to keep track of how many migraines you're having per month or week or whatever. Now we're working as a team and just measuring it increases the likelihood that it's gonna be better. And then the clients encourage because they're measuring it and they're seeing changes. And we're partnering with them to succeed. The pathway doesn't need to cover everything, just their biggest priorities. And it gives the client a way to win. And then at every single consult, we must touch on these goals. I, you can imagine a client who went away and said, wow, my practitioner believes in me and they tracked and they paid attention. And you come in the next time and they're all ready to share their stuff with you. And you say, so how are you? And they tell you some stuff and then you say, okay, well, I think we're good. And they're, they're like, we're not following up on the goals you gave me? That would be a terrible thing. Don't do that. Help the client feel partnered. So how do you personally implement this? Connect with your why. Your purpose is unique and it's about your life path. It's not just about your practice. When you own it, it attracts clients. And this is private to you. You don't go put it out on your website and stuff. It's just in you. Really see how rare and valuable your skill can be. Really emphasize your career capital, which is clinical efficacy and all the things we talked about today. Next steps, choose a niche. Choose a niche where people are looking for CAM practitioners. Follow your interests, find a demographic you like to work with, study up, skill up. Clarify your communications, clean up your elevator speech and figure out your criteria for your invitation and start doing it. Be a healing presence, be an extraordinary gift in the life of your client who may not have anybody else who ever says anything kindly and encouraging to them. Affirm with all those CAM consumer statements. Get diagnostic congruence with every client. And then get good at building a pathway that invites the client to walk with you as an ally toward a future they want to be part of. And just like I learned for me, I was enough just as I was right now. Every one of you is enough just as you are right now. Yashi, that's it.
Oh my God, that was so beautiful. Okay, um, I'm going to, if you can stop screen sharing, I'll open it up so that you can see everybody and then people can talk to you. Okay, I just have one last yes, thing. Yes, please. A lot of the material that I just presented is part of a series that I teach that's seven months long called Startup to Stellar. And uh, we will be teaching this class again starting in September. So if you're interested, you can find information about it on the hub. That's it. Let me stop my video. Okay. Thank you so much, Karen. I mean, I didn't know what to expect, but you blow my mind each time you talk. It's like the pearls of wisdom that come out of your mouth. I walk away. It's almost like you talk to me, like there's a connection. It's like you read my mind for everything that I'm thinking or questions that I have. You give answers even without my asking. So I love you so much. So I'm going to open it up. Um, you can unmute yourself and talk to Karen and she'll be more than happy to ask questions. I mean, to answer all your questions. So if there's a question you want to ask, you don't want to be recorded, just save it. So I'll let any, everybody who wants to ask a question, which might be more general in nature, and then once we are done with those, I can stop recording and you guys can still continue because this is supposed to be a forum for like informal chat. And I'm sure Karen will be happy to stay back and talk to us. Thank you. Absolutely. <clears throat> it's your cue, guys. Afternoon, Karen. Hello, Amit. How are you? Good to well, hear from you. It was so actually inspirational to hear about all this. I'm still pursuing my education in, in, in homeopathy right now. So for me, this is kind of new. I just want to ask you something. When you talked about creating a niche, how do you know what sort of a niche you are when you are a new practitioner? You know, you can sort of uh, be a chooser and choose a particular niche initially when you're sort of just you know starting your practice mm -hmm. as a new practitioner. So there are a couple of things. Sometimes because of people's own life experience, they have a niche that they're interested in them. You know, um, I got I, in early on in my practice, I got interested through some weird cases with women's health and reproductive health. And then I just started, I didn't even know that I needed a niche. It just became my niche because I really liked working with that population. So sometimes it's a demographic that you like, like there are some people who never want to work with teenagers. So don't choose niches that have to do with that. You know, I have, I have colleagues who have chosen eating disorders or concussions or sequela of head injuries or chronic fatigue or irritable bowel or whatever. And sometimes people are afraid to choose a niche because they're worried that they're going to get pigeonholed and those are the only cases they're ever going to see. And I promise you that is not true because somebody will come to you for your niche and then they will say, oh, would you see my sister? She doesn't have this thing, but you know, she's heard about you. And then you're like, yeah, sure. So yeah, that, that should help choose something that you're interested in with the demographic that you like. And in the document that I showed you, it showed exactly what is driving people out of conventional medicine into CAM. And if you choose those things, that will be easier. Now, there are some things that you can choose that are really highly politicized and exceedingly problematic. Vaccine injury. Not that it's not needed, but it's going to be a touchstone that will make your practice like a lightning rod. So that you probably don't want to really go with. <laughs> thank you so but much. That was really probably, helpful. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you. There's a, a question in the chat, how can I let the word out about my practice, especially if I'm consulting online? Great question. So once you've chosen your niche, you've got a website that's up. And for those of you, I know some of you who are here are on the hub. On the hub, there's an eight hour class that Tracy Carcutt Law from the UK did called Building an Online Presence, where she talks all about 
How do you put up a website? What do you put onto your website? She has a very sophisticated strategy about all of it. How do you start a newsletter? The way that you, if you have a niche, how do you get the word out? You do your research and then you create a blog, a style of blog on your website called a curated blog, where you say two or three sentences of your own. There was a research study recently that showed that Bach flowers are very useful in post-concussion for dealing with anxiety. This was published on the Harvard Review Medical blah, blah, blah. And here's the link. See what you think. It doesn't take you very long to read. And by pulling in very credible uh, sources, you become somebody that looks very legit. And then you become findable. And if you do this more and more and more, you are out there with your breadcrumbs scattered around the internet. And then you do your visualization, people will find you. They really will. There are some of you in here who are stellars, who I know, super sellers who have been through the program and have used this visualization. And I've heard from you, yes, it works. Yes, clients start calling me. Other questions, Yashi? No, I, I was about to read that one. And you, like I said, you have a step ahead of me. I'm just gonna read some of the comments. You've already read them. Thank you so much. So inspiring. This was amazing, much appreciated. Great help for a new practitioner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, Thank you for your time and I'm going to stop recording and then we'll just open it up to like an informal chat for everybody. Um, they can just talk. Maybe there are some people who want to ask questions, but they don't want to be on, on video. So thank you so much, Karen, for this. This was so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop Absolutely. recording now and then we'll just open it up.